All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. As usual, I'm MC Owens. Uh, and tonight, what's the theme for tonight? <clears throat> the theme for tonight's Dharma Doors is it's a word I had never actually really heard. It's certainly an, an idea, but I didn't know the Sanskrit or Pali word for it. So the word or the theme for tonight is a pramadya, conscientiousness. I'm not the biggest fan of the term conscientiousness. It's kind of a mouthful. And of course, when you see it, you're like conscience, like what? So, but I want you to uh, know more about this word, more about what we're going to talk about tonight. So here you go. We're just going to do a quick little background on this word or this idea. So the word apramadya, it's going to come up in our reading tonight. And it's one of those things where to prepare us for how it appears in the text, I wanted to talk a little bit about it just as a, a practice, as a quality of a bodhisattva, since that's sort of the theme that we've been working with here on the Dharma Doors lately, or the bodhisattva path. So. I won't bother you with all of the linguistic details. It, by the way, I don't mention this enough. If you're into language and you're into Buddhism, there's two books you should really have, which are the Edgerton Buddhist Hybrid Sanskrit Dictionary and the Reese Davies Pali English Dictionary. So these two are essential to sort of studying Dharma or studying Buddhism in that way. So I go looking up apramadya in the, this book, cause it's a Sanskrit word. They tell me about the Pali word. We go looking up the Pali word, this uh, apamada, not apramadya, but apamada. And then that word means apamada, <laughs> not Pamada and pamada means not mindful, not at, literally mindful. Actually, the word has to do with thoughtless. So, not being thoughtless is apramadya. And you might think you you might think that this is about sati, uh, meditation, focus, concentration mindfulness. And what I like about the theme for tonight's Dharma doors and the way that it kind of fits into the Bodhisattva practice, this isn't about seated meditation, mindfulness, focus. Apramadya is very much about how one conducts oneself out in the world. And you know, I'll tell you, I, for me, you know, there's so many ways to understand this idea. Again, the word conscientious is the way it, it's the way it's translated in the text that we're reading. It more or less, I guess, is the most appropriate English word because to be conscientious is to be considerate of others. But in particular, it's not just sort of like, you know, there's a lot of aspects to the practice, but it's not just about being considerate or kind or something in that way to others, but it's actually about being mindful in that sense of being very kind of conscious and aware of what you're doing, how what you're doing might be affecting others, and, you know, this is sort of, um, here's just one example of a zillion examples. When I first went to Japan back in the 90s, it was a huge lesson in apramadya. Not about being conscientious in terms of bowing and in terms of you know, things that we might think of as being conscientious. I'm thinking specifically 
about the, the cultural custom of removing your shoes before you go inside somewhere. I went in the late 90s and, you know, I was studying Buddhism at that point. So I was very much sort of on my, you know, proper behavior kind of guide in that, in that sense. And so I was sort of all constantly trying to be aware of the cultural customs, very being mindful of when to take my shoes off, being mindful of all these different things. And, you know, you would go to various, uh, or I would go to various temples, or I would go to different cultural institutions or what have you. And of course, I would be a little shocked sometimes to see Europeans, Westerners, just go barging right into a temple and have to be told like, oh, you know, please leave your shoes outside, right? Versus someone who sees the rows of shoes outside and is like, oh, and so takes the shoes off and goes in. That is apramadya. It's a practice of mindfulness, but it's sort of, it's a very, like, you have to be fully mindful because you may, you don't know what exactly you're trying to be mindful for in that way. So you just sort of have to be aware of what you're doing, aware of how what you're doing might affect others in that sense. And, you know, of course, this is, um, if you're into like, uh, the idea of the social contract and like that idea of morality. This is a good aspect of the social contract in terms of, you know, social harmony and all of that. But tonight, of course, what we're going to suggest is that this type of behavior, being conscientious or being or practicing apramadya, it's another level of meditation. And the idea is, is that you're doing this all the time, not just for one hour or not just when you're in the meditation hall, but just practicing being conscientious all the time in that way. So that's the kind of the theme for tonight. And of course, this shouldn't be a big surprise in the sense that the sutra that we've been reading, it's been about the Bodhisattva path. And the one idea that I sort of have been emphasizing a lot the last few months, because we have been going through this text for a while now, the thing that I've been really trying to emphasize about the Bodhisattva path is how, um, to use the, the term, how socially engaged of a practice it is. That yes, there are components of seated meditation, of course, and a bodhisattva, like any practitioner of the Dharma, is going to be comfortable without sensory stimuli, <laughs> comfortable just being, so meditating in that more traditional sense. Absolutely, a bodhisattva practices that form of meditation. But in addition to that, a big part of the practice is about how one engages with the other. Now, of course, Buddhism as a system of morality has always been about proper engagement with the other, not taking their stuff, not lying to them, speaking kindly, not using divisive speech. All of the morality, all of the shila of Buddhism, of course, it is about that social contract or that social arrangement in that sense. But I would suggest that the bodhisattva is approaching their engagement with the other as a deep part of their own practice and not in a way like the, how can I say this? It's not about like, I've been practicing over here <laughs> And now I'm going to go into society and act a certain way. It's about actually viewing social engagements as the practice in that way. And again, that's been a theme of our uh, Pure Land Sutra or 
our Manjushri's Pure Land Sutra that we've been reading. Um, so on that note, so again, that's the topic for tonight, just conscientiousness. It's going to come up in the sutra, so then we'll talk about it again. But before I do that, because I want to read, I want to read a part of the sutra again tonight. And if I can, if I can get to it, it's just a really beautiful moment in the sutra. In many ways, the last maybe four or five or 10 Sundays have been building up to this moment. So I need to recap for a moment about what's going on. So I'm going to sort of re, you know, just reacquaint us with, with the story of this sutra, like what's happened so far. I know it's been a while, and uh, some of you may have not even been here in those first few sessions. So this sutra, and Tanya posted the link we're reading, it's called the uh, Manjushri Buddha Kshetra Guna Vyuha Sutra, <laughs> the array of virtues of Manjushri's Buddha Kshetra, or Buddha field. And this has been a pretty wild sutra, even though it is, it's about Manjushri Bodhisattva. We haven't even met Manjushri Bodhisattva yet. <laughs> he's, he's coming soon in that way. But that's kind of a, an indicator right there that we haven't even really gotten to the sutra yet. <laughs> but prior to this moment, the sutra begins, like all sutras, once, you know, thus have I heard, once the Buddha was staying in, in um, I think he was in Rajgriha. And the first part of the sutra, the Buddha goes into the city. He goes into the great city of Rajgriha, and there's a householder bodhisattva. And the Buddha gives the householder bodhisattva a lesson about being a householder bodhisattva. And that lesson had a lot to do with the idea of emptiness and sort of viewing the house and the, the creature comforts of the household as being empty. And the Buddha basically taught this householder bodhisattva that if he can understand and view the house and all the creature comforts of the household life, if they can view that as empty, that's leaving home. And leaving home, of course, is like a Buddhist term for becoming a monastic. But it's this beautiful idea that if you understand the emptiness of your own home, <laughs> you have left home <laughs> in that sense. So that's the little, that's kind of a very short teaching. And that's a very abridged version of the short teaching that the Buddha gives the householder bodhisattva. Then the Buddha goes up to the vulture's peak, to Gridrakuta. And it even says that up on vulture's peak, the Buddha is going to give a special teaching to just the upper level bodhisattvas, not necessarily just the people hanging out in the city. But before he does that, he says, you know what? There's not enough people here. Or in the Chinese version, which I prefer, he says, you know, it's not beautiful enough. And so he calls, the Buddha calls by putting out a light. And this light illuminates all 10 directions for countless worlds. And then what happens is, is that the sutra shifts to these other realms, these other worlds, where there are bodhisattvas studying under Buddhas who see this light, and they go to their Buddha of their world and ask, where's this light coming from? And the Buddhas of those lands tell each of these bodhisattvas, oh, in the world called Saha, Saha is the Buddhist name for our world, and Saha means endurance. 
we endure this world, Saha. And the Buddhas in all those realms say, oh, the Buddha in the Saha world is about to give a teaching. And what's really beautiful about that part of the sutra is that it starts to describe these bodhisattvas talking to their Buddhas, and the Buddhas tell the bodhisattvas, you might not want to go to the Saha world. <laughs> Sentient beings in the Saha world have a tendency to be a little angry sometimes. <laughs> they have a tendency to be a little rough. You might not want to go. And they all ask their, bodhi, their Buddhas, why would a Buddha, out of all the realms in the multiverse, why would a Buddha be reborn in such a troublesome world? And that's when all these other Buddhas say, oh, you don't understand. That Buddha is doing something really amazing by being reborn in the Saha world and practicing this great patience. At that, all of these bodhisattvas say, I want to go to the Saha world and practice patience. <laughs> and the Buddha says, each of the Buddhas say, if you think it's the right time, you should go. And one by one, all the bodhisattvas of the 10 directions come to our world called Saha and gather on the vulture's peak to hear the Buddha teach this special teaching about how a bodhisattva beautifies their Buddha land or their pure land with arrays or bouquets of virtues. <laughs> so they all flock, and then the Buddha begins to give the teaching to all of the bodhisattvas from the Ten Directions, and he's primarily speaking to a monk named Shariputra. And so when the Buddha's been talking to Shariputra, he's been talking about all of these various virtues or qualities that if a bodhisattva develops them, they will purify their Buddha land. And, you know, a couple of things that I want to mention about th uh, that idea of purifying one's Buddha land. I've done so many talks on it now. I've done several just on that idea of what that means to purify one's Buddha land. So I'm not going to repeat all of that here. But what I want to mention is the process of like being a bodhisattva or becoming a bodhisattva or what have you, I'm, all, I'm going, there's so many aspects to it. In fact, that's of course what we've been reading about, but I want to focus just on two specific ideas that have come up. The first of the ideas, and I did a whole talk about this, it's about the idea of the bodhisattva vow, the vow of the bodhisattva. And this is such an important idea. It really is what distinguishes a bodhisattva from some other form of practitioner in that sense. So I, again, I did a whole night on this, so I'm just going to summarize it. But the idea of the bodhisattva vow, I want to kind of just clarify this, or, or again, just put it very, very simply. The idea is you can imagine, how can I put this? <laughs> you can imagine somebody has a, a problem. Could be any kind of number of problems, but it's a problem in terms of something that they're doing. Maybe it's something that they're addicted to. Maybe it's a habit they have they don't want, or maybe, you know, but something that they've come to this decision that they really would like to not do that anymore. So they might make a vow to stop. And that, that vow to stop that behavior, hopefully, it works. Like it, one stops the behavior. 
And the idea is, is that then one could reach a point where they feel as if they have like, you know, conquered that habit in that way. And so they could have a sense of accomplishment in that sense. And, you know, like a lot of, uh, for myself, this was, has been part of the process. Once you kind of solve or work out one problem, it really just kind of opens up a view to how many problems one has, <laughs> like the other problems. And so again, the idea is if you get that one problem over under control and things open up and you're like, oh, I got this other problem, I could probably tackle that one as well. Do some practices, what have you, depending on what type of the problem it is. And maybe you conquer that one too. And now you're on a roll. <laughs> so now you're really kind of interested in the process or the path of purification, as it would be called in the early Buddhist tradition. The idea of really working out a lot of these bad habits. And maybe it's going so well, you've decided to make like a really, you know, nice, important vow, which is a vow to like, get rid of all the bad habits, like really, really purify this baby out in that sense. Now, of course, kind of, I'm kind of speaking vaguely <laughs> about the early kind of form of Buddhism that we call Hinayana or whatever. And the idea is, is that it is a path that is focused on individual purification in a way that more or less I just described, where it might start with a problem with sexuality, for example, uncontrollable sexuality. That seems to have been a problem in early Buddhism. And so maybe from that coming, you know, coming to control that one bad habit or that just that one habit, let's not judge it, but a habit. The idea is one could go for arhatship. What an arhat is this early Buddhist idea, a Hinayana idea of somebody who is totally cleared out of all the bad habits. So that would be, again, a very, very, you know, brief, basic summary of the path of purification, as it's called the Visuddhi Magga, and the way that that is about purifying one's karma, purifying one's samskara, purifying all of those habits. And I put that, I worded that in a very particular way. And what that was is I, I worded it as making a vow to stop doing that one, that thing that you wanted to stop doing. And again, I wanna put this in that very clear way where this isn't about somebody telling you to stop doing whatever X, Y, or Z. This is about one coming to their own decision that, that they've come to them decision that they would like to stop these behaviors or what have you. And so they've made the vow. I wanna stop doing that. Okay, so again, that's a way of being Buddhist, and it's kind of called the Hinayana. The Bodhisattva vow. The Bodhisattva vow is this very, very profound idea uh, and, uh, of actually not... <laughs> particularly, and I say that very clear, particularly concerned with one's own suffering, one's own problems in that sense. The vow of a bodhisattva is in a sense, let me put it to you this way, to help all other sentient beings with their problem, problems. The vow, the great vow of a bodhisattva is in a sense to put all others enlightenment before one's own. Now, it's complicated. There's a lot of technicalities to all of this, but that is the general sense that I wanna get across tonight, that you could think of the Bodhisattva vow as, and this is the way that I describe it, but as an altruistic, 
turning of the heart. Altruistic, meaning really honestly concerned about all others. Not just some others, not just one's family, not just one's friends, not just one's country or what have you, but actually a deep concern for all sentient beings. And again, the vow of, of basically putting their enlightenment above one's own enlightenment, that that is the practice. Or again, let me kind of be a little more less cliche. Let me be less cliche and a little more exact. The Bodhisattva realizes or understands that their own enlightenment is dependent upon the enlightenment of all others. And so it's this kind of big group enlightenment in that sense that the Bodhisattva is vowing to bring about. And this idea that I just outlined at the beginning, the idea of just being concerned about one's own problems, start to seem so, such a small vow in that way. So this is, and I'm mentioning this because the sutra is going to mention it in a minute or whenever I get to it, it's going to mention this unique aspiration of the bodhisattva. And a unique aspiration of the bodhisattva is this very special altruistic turning of the heart towards all sentient beings. So that's a big part of like when one starts to head off on the bodhisattva path is when one makes that vow, that vow to sort of, again, awaken or, or help bring to awaken all sentient beings. So that's what we're after as bodhisattvas in that sense. And I can now just kind of quickly say that the process of doing that, the process of bringing all sentient beings to awakening, you could call that purifying one's Buddha land. So I'm going to just quickly kind of explain it that way. There's a lot, again, a lot more to the idea of purifying one's Buddha land, but that's sort of the beginning of the process in that sense. And then we've been learning, again, all of these different practices, all of these different qualities or behaviors of bodhisattvas that lead to the purification of their Buddha land. And then last week, we were introduced to the, the second aspect of the bodhisattva path that I want to mention. And it's the idea of what's called parinamana, uh, transference. It's, it's usually worded as the transference of merit. It's probably how you might know it, so I'll stick to that language. But this parinamana, this transference of merit, a really fun, funny way to think about the transference of merit so merit, if you're not familiar with it, uh, is punya in Sanskrit. And punya is this idea of, well, the idea that if you do a good karmic act, you get merit. You get this kind of metaphysical reward or metaphysical merit. And if you accumulate enough merit, phew, it could do all kinds of things. It could ensure a better rebirth. It could purify one's mind, leading to enlightenment. I mean, the, the cultivation of punya is a big part of the process. If you're not, and I like to always point this out to, to, to people who are listening, if you're not into the idea of merit, like you're not into the idea of, of, of there being a metaphysical uh, punya in that sense, you can really just substitute the idea of a, of a, like a benefit, a benefit to doing something. So my point is, is that there would be a benefit to uh, being moral in that sense. There's a benefit 
to not stealing, according to the Buddhist tradition. There's a benefit to that. You could call it punya, or you could just say that it's a benefit, whereas to get involved in stealing and wanting to steal and planning to steal, it's, it's, not, it's unbeneficial in that sense. So here's the idea, though. Let's say a bodhisattva were to do something beneficial or do something meritorious in that sense. They would get punya in that way. So the idea is, is that a bodhisattva is deep in this practice. And so they're not really, as I mentioned a moment ago, they're not really interested in just enlightening themselves. And so there is a process called parinamana, which is whatever merit, whatever punya I've generated from, let's say, from teaching this class, you know, teaching a Dharma class, this is supposed to be a very uh, meritorious act in that way. So whatever merit I get, I transfer to the benefit of all of you. I transfer for the benefit of all sentient beings. Not trying to claim it, own it, not trying to pat myself on the back in any way. And in fact, even if you tell me I get a better rebirth, I'm not interested in a better rebirth. So transfer the merit. You know what the funny thing is though? You know how much merit you get for transferring all that merit, you get all, you get a lot more merit. So you know what you gotta do? Transfer that merit as well. Oh, and now you're just getting showered with merit. And so it becomes a constant practice of transferring merit in that way. And as I mentioned last week, I wanna mention this again, cause I think it's a really, really important aspect to Parinamana to this transference of merit, it really seems like it is a Buddhist way to counteract transactional ways of thinking that are really, really deeply ingrained in us. And they're, they're very, very deeply ingrained. In fact, it's so deeply ingrained that it even percolates or translates to merit in that way, where this idea that if I do something nice for you, something's got to be coming back this way. You, I either, I got to get paid for this, or I got to get married, but it can't just be like that, right? So there's a way that we think, and it, of course, in the modern world, it's a very capitalist way of thinking, which is that everything is very accountable in that sense. And so for every action this way, something's coming this way. And that's from a bodhisattva or Buddhist point of view, that's kind of an illness <laughs> to think that way. And so a practice to get out of the habit of thinking that way is just keeping it moving, paying it forward, as they would say. But again, making it a practice where you are in that mode of you know, recognizing that what one is doing might be meritorious or not. It's an important part about the Bodhisattva path to be aware that what one is doing is, say, correct or samyak, proper in that way. So we don't want to blur. We're not blurring the mind into some way that we're not aware of what is good versus bad. But the idea is, is that there is a danger, and Buddhism is not the only tradition to point out this danger, but there is a danger to the practitioner developing this sense of pride, of like, ah, I, I did such a good thing in that way. And again, this is a delicate thing because we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater in that sense of deny the good versus the bad in that way, in terms of practice. But then we kind of want to check or recognize the possibility that one is clinging to, desirous of, or attached to 
that sense that I did something good. Again, from a practice point of view, that can be reinforcing of an, a certain idea of a self. It could be reinforcing of just the idea of self, period. But I'm speaking or thinking specifically about reinforcing a notion or idea of oneself in that way. And if the big part of the whole process is about coming to a deeper understanding of no self, then holding on to one's merit and like keeping a little log and being like a few more merit points, that might not do it in that way. But the practice of the transference of merit is a great way to counteract that transactional way of thinking. So, and what do, you know, yes, I mentioned, by the way, transferring that merit to all sentient beings. The way that it's worded in our sutra is that the bodhisattva, the section that we had been reading starting uh, last week, it was a section about how the bodhisattva sees all the suffering in the world. And when they hear about the suffering of animals or they hear about the suffering of, of those enslaved or anything, the, they generate great compassion. That's what the text said. Upon hearing about the sufferings of others, the bodhisattva generates this great compassion and then makes this vow makes a further kind of wish or a vow and says you know when i become a buddha in my buddha land there won't be any suffering and then one thing that i read last week that i want to remind everybody just so we can understand uh, the way the sutra works last week one of them was is that the bodhisattva thinks to themselves or that they wish saying in my Buddha land, may all sentient beings uh, need for food, for sustenance, for clothing, may all of their needs be fulfilled as they wish. Like this idea that in my Buddha land, nobody's gonna go hungry. Anytime anybody wants something to eat, it's gonna be like Neverland and boom, they can have it and be satisfied. And I mentioned last week where, yeah, you know, that might sound a little utopian to, to really use the, the expression properly, a world that doesn't exist, an utopia, right? That might sound like totally fantasy land. But what I wanted to point out last week was, let's think about the opposite of that way of thinking. And what I pointed out is that one could have the mentality of like, you know, hoping others are in need. Oh, like how terrible of a thought to like wish others in, were in need. But then I pointed out there's could be a mentality where somebody thinks it would be really great if the entire world was dependent upon some product that they provide. <laughs> and that could be somebody's heartfelt wish that they could get really wealthy or own a company that everybody is dependent upon. And therefore I could be the most powerful, important person in the world because everybody would need to network through me. You can imagine somebody might have that mentality. I can't imagine having that mentality, but I live in a world where it's imaginable. And I want to point out that that mentality for some people has manifested that reality for them. There are very powerful people in this world to whom many of us or, you know, rely on or depend on in that way. And they are very wealthy as a result of that dependence. So my point is, is that those people probably got there through a wish for it to be that way. And so is it that wild of an idea for the Bodhisattva to wish it to be the other way? Again, I'm suggesting one might be able to actually manifest a world in which these things are possible, but at the very least, it's a healthy mental exercise to wish for the welfare of others rather than the downfall of others in that sense.
So, and what we learned was that thinking that way, and that was just one of many ways for the Bodhisattva to think and to aspire or wish for a world like that. And what we learned was that that wish or that vow is part of this process of purifying one's Buddha land. Okay, so that was a really quick major review of the sutra up to this point. Everybody doing okay with that? Feeling good with the basic premises and all that? Cool. So let's get to tonight. Um, so for the first time so far, I am going to skip some sections. I, I kind of started reviewing the sutra and realized that if I don't speed this up a little bit, we could be here a very long time. So there are a few more of these wishes or these aspirational thoughts. I'm going to skip over them. Um, you know, we've done a lot of talking. I'll give you one example. We've done a lot of talking about the whole Shravaka versus Pratekya Buddha, the, you know, the, the student versus the solitary enlightened one. If, if these terms don't mean anything to you, don't worry about it. But the sutra has talked about the problems of wanting to be a Shravaka or wanting to be a Pratekya Buddha. And so, for example, one of them is the Bodhisattva says, in my Buddha land, there won't be any Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas. A Shravaka is basically one of those people that has vowed to liberate themselves only in that way. And so the Bodhisattva is saying, in my Buddha land, there's not going to be any self-interested enlightenment seekers. There will only be Bodhisattvas in that way. So again, there's a few more of these. Let me just read one or two. Yeah, let me read this one for sure. This, is, this one will give you another taste of purifying one's Buddha land. So the Buddha tells Shariputra, oh, by the way, Tanya keeps giving you the link. And if you'd like to know exactly where I am, I'm at, and um, the text has these numbers on the side. So I'm at line 1.149. <laughs> That's the first time I'm if I ever mentioning that. So you can find it. I don't know what page number it is because it's a long PDF in that sense. Okay. The Buddha tells Shariputra, and by the way, all of those bodhisattvas that have gathered from the 10 directions, he says, furthermore, Shariputra, when awakening, when bodhi is attained by bodhisattvas who have not taken others' belongings and who have rejoiced in the success of others, all the beings in their Buddha realms will have an abundance of resources that can't be plundered, and they will have great attainments in the Dharma. So one before this was about how if a bodhisattva only speaks kind words, then in their Buddha land, Everybody will speak kindly in that sense, and they will only hear pleasing speech. In this one, it mentions that the bodhisattva who has never committed atadana, taking what has not been given, that is the prohibition in that sense. So any bodhisattva or a bodhisattva who has not taken what has not been given and who has rejoiced in others' success all the beings in their Buddha lands will have an abundance of resources that can't be plundered. So it's similar to the one I'd mentioned about everybody kind of having everything they need in that way. But the one little thing that I wanted to mention, so the idea of rejoicing in the success of others, that is the pretty classical way to define mudita, M-U-D-I-T-A. Mudita is the third immeasurable state of mind, as they're called, the immeasurables. Uh, 
metta karuna mudita upeksha, which is to say, friendliness or loving kindness, metta, karunya, compassion, and then the third of these immeasurables is mudita, rejoicing in, rejoicing in the success of others. What I love about this sutra is it is actually so truly instructional in that way. It's such a very instructional text about the Bodhisattva path. And it wasn't really until I read this that it dawned on me from being taught by the Buddha here that that practice, the practice of mudita, which is to say rejoicing in the successes of others, it's such a perfect antidote or, or practice to counteract this desire to steal, this desire to take somebody else's stuff. It's, it's a beautiful way of noticing that, that that tendency or that desire in that sense, which is like, ooh, that person's got a nice X, Y, or a Z. Like they are, they've been very successful. They've managed to get these things. I'll take them. So that's the idea of stealing in that sense. Versus this idea of a mindset that rejoices in the successes of others. Again, it's just a beautiful compliment. It's a beautiful way of presenting the Dharma in that way, an idea that we've, we're all familiar with mudita, or I think many of us are familiar with mudita, but to really notice that it's this way of rejoicing in others' success in that sense. All right, there's a few more of these. Again, I just wanted to kind of give us a flavor. Um, and yeah, and I'll just finish it here. So all of this section concludes with the Buddha saying, Shariputra, even if I were to teach about the abundant arrays of virtues of the Buddha realms of bodhisattvas for a kalpa or more, I would not reach the limit of the Buddha's eloquence on this topic. Nevertheless, this has been just a brief presentation to help those noble sons and daughters who follow the Bodhisattva path with an abundance of interest and pure motivation to perfect its message. Okay, so that brings to a conclusion sort of all of the, the various qualities that we've been learning about for weeks now in terms of how a bodhisattva would go about purifying their Buddha land. Then the Buddha says, Shariputra, if bodhisattvas have three qualities, they will swiftly and fully awaken to Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, unsurpassed perfect enlightenment, and will manifest a Buddha realm according to their wishes. Meaning the wishes they made before about everybody having everything and all of that. So what are the three you may ask? What are these three qualities that will basically get us enlightened and purify our Buddha land? They are apramadya, conscientiousness or thoughtfulness. Two, earnest practice. And three, having that unique aspiration or that unique vow, the unique vow of a bodhisattva. Shariputra, if bodhisattvas have those three qualities, they will swiftly and fully awaken to Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi and manifest Buddha realms according to their wishes. So I'm going to just read the rest of this. I just want to say a few things about those, diff those three uh, qualities really quickly. So the first one, again, was apramadya, the idea of being conscientious or thoughtful in the way that I described. 
like taking your shoes off in Japan, like being mindful and all of that. So that's the first one. The second one, the second one's sort of a little complicated linguistically. It's about this idea of practice. It's about the idea of some sincere, earnest practice. There's a lot to that because it's the way that it's written, the, lang the specific language, it's kind of referring specifically to what would be called Bodhi practices, Bodhicharya. Bodhi practices, which is to say practices that lead to awakening, practices that lead to Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, are usually tacitly understood to be the paramitas. The six paramitas are usually the Bodhi practices. So earnestly practicing the way of Bodhi or awakening, that's the second one. And then again, the third is about this unique aspiration that a Bodhisattva makes that we've been talking about now for weeks and weeks. So I'm going to read just the next section. I'm going to read it pretty much in its entirety, but it's kind of a mental exercise. I got to tell you, there's a lot of elements here. Um, I really hope that I can read it clearly and in, you know, well in that sense so that I, that it's, that I do my part, but I want you to know that it's, you know, I've read this several times and it's just all three of these practices, being conscientious, practicing earnestly and making a unique vow. Those three are going to, well, first of all, they're not going to stay in that order. So they're going to keep switching the order on us. And it actually makes it a little difficult to keep up. And they're going to start layering a lot of ideas. So Shariputra responds to those three qualities. Venerable Shariputra said to the Blessed One, said to the Buddha, Blessed One, the Tathagata, the Buddha, is remarkably well-spoken. Blessed one, the factors of awakening are all rooted in apramadya, in conscientiousness. Awakening rests on earnest practice. And the abundant arrays of virtues of the Buddha realms of bodhisattvas are manifested by having a unique aspiration. The Buddha responded to Shariputra saying, Shariputra, so it is, so it is. The factors of awakening are all rooted in conscientiousness. Awakening rests on earnest practice and the bun abundant arrays of virtues of the Buddha realms of bodhisattvas are manifested by having this unique aspiration. Shariputra, I manifested a Buddha realm that accords with my previous aspirations. Shariputra, I fulfilled my unique vows by, my, by maintaining conscientiousness. Shariputra, I attained awakening by practicing earnestly. Shariputra, those who are not conscientious, who obsess about language, or who are not earnest in their practice, they're unable to even attain the level of a shravaka, not to mention anuttara samyak sambodhi unsurpassable complete awakening. Therefore, Shariputra, bodhisattvas who want to know if they are real bodhisattvas should train in these bodhisattva practices. At that, 
84,000 bodhisattvas in the assembly then arose from their seats. Joining their palms together, they pledged to the Buddha with one voice saying, Blessed one, we will train in these bodhisattva practices. We will practice earnestly. We will live conscientiously. And we will fulfill our unique vow. We will perfect the abundance of Buddha realms until we have fulfilled our aspirations as we have formed them. We will engage in this bodhisattva conduct. Then the Blessed One smiled, whereupon Venerable Shariputra asked the Blessed One, World honored one, what are the causes and conditions for you to smile? The blessed one asked, Shariputra, did you just see all these noble children roar the lion's roar? <gasps> blessed one, I did. The Buddha said, Shariputra, after 100,000 kalpas, these noble children will fully awaken to Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. Shariputra, for instance, I can see that now, sorry, I can see that in some Buddha realms, only a Tathagata named Simha will appear. Likewise, in all those bodhisattvas specific Buddha realms, the Buddhas, the Tathagatas, will only appear by the name called Array of Aspirations. Moreover, Shariputra, the Buddha realms of all those Tathagatas will be no different in their arrays of virtues from those of the Tathagata worthy one and perfectly enlightened Buddha, Amitabha, in all aspects, except for their lifespan. Shariputra asked, O blessed one, what will their lifespans be? The Buddha responded, Shariputra, the lifespan of each of those Tathagatas will be ten Kalpas. Okay, so that concludes that section. So once again, just want to kind of look at that. Those three qualities, the idea of being conscientious, the idea of practicing earnestly, and then making this unique vow, those were those three qualities. And then the Buddha made that really interesting statement, or I think it's very interesting, where he said that I manifested a Buddha realm that accords with my previous unique aspirations. I fulfilled my vows by maintaining conscientiousness. And I attained awakening by earnest practice. So... The idea, of course, is that a bodhisattva is bound for Buddhahood. This is, you know, we've talked about this before when we talked more in depth about the bodhisattva path. And that's part of what that unique special vow or unique aspiration is all about. It's not about being an arhat. It's not about being a fully purified human. <laughs> bodhisattva is going for Buddhahood. And so the Buddha who attained Buddhahood is saying, yeah, that's how I did it. <laughs> that's the idea. And uh, I also wanted to note too, how Shariputra says like, wow, it's like the whole thing is resting on conscientiousness, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says this thing about, it's like, it's all about conscientiousness in terms of the practice. And there's a way that if you really think about like deep, deep 
conscientiousness. Like really consider that idea of being conscientious of all others. That looks like the practice to me. <laughs> that looks like the Dharma to me. Ev for me, everything fits into that, <laughs> that idea. Everything from morality to the meditation, you name it. To really, really be thoughtful in that way. Now, of course, the idea is one needs to practice that earnestly <laughs> in that way. And as far as our sutra is concerned here, it helps or it, one needs to have that unique aspiration of awakening all sentient beings, of purifying a Buddha land in that way. And so from those th the interconnectedness of those three qualities, the Buddha was able to purify his Buddha realm and so that's the way all bodhisattvas would do it in that way. Everybody feeling okay with the teaching, the general teaching about those three? Cool. Cool. So just a few more words about how that ended then. So, you know, the main reason why I wanted to recap the whole earlier part of the sutra is I wanted to remind us, or again, if you weren't there for it, I wanted to tell you that this teaching, according to the sutra, you know, was given, you know, to this, you know, kind of uh, Marvel cinematic universe of the Dharma <laughs> with all of these bodhisattvas coming from all of these different realms. And so, you know, there was a big, there was a very big buildup to this teaching where like beings were coming from other dimensions to hear this teaching. And those, or at least 84,000 of those bodhisattvas joined their palms and said, yeah, we'll do that. We'll train that way. And I guess, again, I wanted to remind everybody that those bodhisattvas came from all those other realms because they wanted to learn from the Buddha how to practice that, that profound patience, that profound kshanti, the tolerance, and the conscientiousness in that way. So then, after these 84,000 bodhisattvas make this commitment to being conscientious, to practicing earnestly, and to having a unique aspiration, the Buddha smiles. And we know from reading all the different sutras in the Dharma doors, we know that when a Buddha smiles, it means that they're about to make the prediction of somebody's enlightenment. Now here, the Buddha is not just making the prediction of enlightenment of one person, He's making the prediction of enlightenment of all 84,000 of these bodhisattvas, that they all will achieve their, the purification of their Buddha lands. And in some of their Buddha lands, the Buddha will only be known as Simha, as lion. And likewise, in others, the Buddha in all of those, or actually not the Buddha, but they themselves as the Buddha will be known as a ray of aspirations. And yeah, so, and then the Buddha makes this interesting comment when he says, Shariputra, did you see all these noble children roar the lion's roar? So I've done a talk on the lion's roar many, many Sundays ago. Um, you know, traditionally the lion's roar is, again, traditionally, is a reference to the moment the baby Buddha was born. And you may have seen the image of the Buddha, disco Buddha, disco baby Buddha, right? Where he's pointing one finger up, one finger down. So Disco Baby Buddha, who's pointing up all the way to the highest Akanista heaven and pointing down 
all the way to the lowest, hottest hell, the Avicii hell. So all the way from Akanista to Avicii. That is all the paths of rebirth possible. Again, from the highest heavenly realm, all the other heavenly realms, the realm of the Asuras, the realm of humans, the realm of animals, the realm of hunger ghosts, all through the, the hell realms to the lowest hell. The Buddha declares upon, or Siddhartha, I should say, Siddhartha Gautama, declares up almost basically the moment he was born, points up, points down and says, I'm not, I'm not going to be reborn in any of those realms anymore. This is my last rebirth. And to declare that this is your last rebirth, that is to make the lions roar. Again, traditionally, it was only Siddhartha Gautama who made the lions roar. The Buddha made the lions roar, renounced family life, left home, did austerities, became awakened, and then taught the Dharma. And in the early path, in the Hinayana, in the Arhat path, we follow what the Buddha said and become purified. That's that tradition. But again, a bodhisattva is going for Buddhahood. And so at some point, at some point, a bodhisattva's got to make the lion's roar. Now, you can think about the lion's roar a lot of different ways. Um, I mean, I already mentioned a few different ways, but what I mean is, is that this declaration that this is one's last rebirth, there's, there's some interesting ways to understand that idea of the lion's roar. One way to understand it is this sort of, um, well, a kind of a more... I don't, want to, I don't want to belittle it by calling it mythological, but in terms of the actual idea of the cycles of birth, death, and rebirth, the actual ideas of reincarnation, the Bodhisattva says, like, I'm getting off of the treadmill of samsara. <laughs> I'm, get, I'm stepping off the treadmill. And so it's, I don't want to be reborn as a hell dweller, as a animal as a human in fact i don't want to be reborn in a heavenly realm where i get to have whatever i want i don't actually i want to get off the treadmill of samsara and so metaphysically or reincarnationally speaking it's about ending the cycle of birth death and rebirth that's what buddhism has always been about is transcending the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. You could also interpret the lion's roar insofar as it pertains to birth and then death and then rebirth and then death and then rebirth. Insofar as the, the lion's roar has to do with that, not specifically being reborn as an animal or as a god, but just in terms of the idea of birth, being, and ceasing, and then arising again and being again and ceasing again. When a bodhisattva makes this lion's roar and says, <laughs> says, rebirth, you're done, right? That kind of idea you could think of that not so metaphysically in terms of reincarnation, but you could think of it more dharmically, philosophically. And what I mean by it is this. So, yeah, and I've been wanting to say a few words about this. It'll kind of um, be a nice conclusion to this part of the sutra. So you are very, you are probably very familiar with the Buddhist practice, the Buddhist teaching of observing the arising, the abiding, 
and the ceasing of phenomena. If, if you're like me and you've gone to various meditation retreats, regardless, regardless of the sect or the school, if you've gone to a Buddhist meditation retreat, you've probably be, been instructed to observe the arising of like, let's say a thought or a feeling or a sensation or an emotion and taught to observe the arising of the sensation the abiding, which is to say the present existing sensation, and then the ceasing or the ending of the sensation. And that process of observing the arising, abiding, and ceasing of phenomena is a big part of the Buddhist tradition. Again, it's how I was taught. The thing about that, oh, and by the way, whether we're talking about stuff objects, cell phones, or emotions, we would talk about the arising, the abiding, and the ceasing. The, you know, there was a day when, there was a day not too long ago when cell phones didn't exist, let alone this cell phone existing. But one day, somewhere, probably, in China, probably at Foxconn at the main facility, this cell phone came rolling off the assembly line <laughs> and therefore it arose. It is now abiding and it will one day cease. Now, if we're not talking about cell phones or emotions or feelings, and we were talking about a sentient being, well, then we would be talking about its birth, its living or being, and then its death, its dying. So I wanted to reacquaint you with that idea of arising, abiding, and ceasing, because I referenced earlier that this sutra started with a teaching about the idea of emptiness. And the thing about emptiness is, and, and this was the comment I've been wanting to make, <laughs> when one is involved in the bodhisattva path and is involved in awakening, which is to say, kind of involved in the wisdom tradition of Buddhism, when, if, when you are in, interested in and involved in the ideas of emptiness, there is nothing to arise. There is nothing currently, presently abiding in that way. And therefore, there is nothing ever to cease in that way. And it's very important to keep those two teachings, I think, separate. That if you are interested in emotions and, and interested in your one's emotions, yes, they arise. They abide and cease. We, we, uh, we do not you know, negate the early Buddhist Dharma because early Dharma is Dharma. It's true. Things, don't, things are impermanent. They arise, they abide, and they cease. What I want to emphasize, though, is that if one is involved in an emptiness practice, the whole point is, is that there isn't anything to arise. There isn't anything abiding. There isn't anything to cease. And so within that realm, if you're, if you're in that, <laughs> you've made the lion's roar. Because the idea of practicing emptiness is cutting off or not, no longer participating in that idea of being a birthed being, not even of being an existent being in the polarity of existent, non-existent, and therefore, not fated to die in that way. And in that sense, I want to remind everybody that in the early days of Buddhism, the Dharma was often called the teaching of the deathless, not the teaching of immortality, not a teaching about how to live forever, a teaching of how to transcend the polarity of birth and death altogether. And so that idea could be a, 
a different way of thinking about the idea of making the lions roar. It's not so much about actually saying, ah, I'm out of samsara, bye everybody. <laughs> it's not exactly that. It could be more of this kind of dharmic philosophical level of emptiness. And then I did want to mention too, a third more straightforward way of thinking about the lion's roar. I, I, I want to share it because I feel like I've done this mode in a way. I don't know about the other two. The other two I'm working on in that way, but the third kind of lion's roar that I want to mention is it's a very simple way or a very simple idea about what can I say? How can I put this? So, so much of being trapped in samsara, right? If you know your dharma, you know what keeps us trapped in the cycle is desire, in particular sensual desire, aversion, and confusion about the nature of self. Greed, anger, delusion. The trifecta of those three and those three, I often like to point out, they're always reinforcing each other because if there's a desire like, ooh, give me that, there needs to be the confusion about there being somebody there that would benefit from that. Or the idea of aversion, it requires there being a sense of somebody there that could benefit from that going away. So being desirous or being averse actually fabricates or creates that deluded sense of self. So those three are in this dance together, and that's what keeps us in the samsaric cycle. That's a basically basic way of understanding that teaching. And if you think about that idea of, oh, like all of this stuff, the stuff, you know, like there, there's a way of looking at all of this and whether it's, you know, take your pick, but it's all like games. It's all little, you know, there's this great quote about when I, you know, it's a biblical quote, but this idea of like, when I was a child, I played as a child and I spoke as a child. But when I grew up, I put down my childish things. That's a quote from Paul. I'm not the type of person that quotes St. Paul, but I like that idea of this idea of growing up in that way. And so my point is, is that we're trapped in samsara because we're delighted <laughs> by these things, these, whatever it is, sexuality or intoxicants or entertainment or whatever. And the idea is, is that this kind of need for those things keeps us in the cycle. And then, of course, being angry, being whiny and not getting what one wants and all of that, that's keeping us in the cycle as well. So for me, an aspect of making the lions roar is kind of just being over it. <laughs> just being over it. Like really seeing it all as childish play and being like, you know what? If you're telling me heaven just has better toys, I'm good. And at that point where one actually is good, and by good, of course, what I mean, I'm spe I speak like a Californian, I speak colloquially, but what I mean by good is content. That's the Buddhist term for it. I don't need, I don't need anything. I'm not angry at anything. I'm not whiny about not getting anything. Those two dynamics, the, the neediness and the angerness, those two things alleviate that delusion of self. And again, kind of what I wanted to point out regarding this lion's roar is it's a moment in one's life when one says, you know what? I'm over it. And that's the lion. It's a little, and maybe it's the lion's whimper, right? So that, like, not quite a roar in that way. Like this is, I know this is my final rebirth. I don't know this is my final rebirth, which is why I don't claim to have made the lions roar in that sense. 
but I do feel like I've made that step of kind of being over it a little bit, or at least over a lot of the things that were keeping me uh, down in that sense. So, all right, questions, comments, answers, ideas about any of that. Yeah, Tanya. I was just thinking you could call it the cat's meow. It, the, the, yeah, it's the, <laughs> the little lion. <laughs> The little lion's roar. Yeah, the lion's meow. Yeah, yeah. No, but thanks for going through those. Yeah, it's a it's a, a an interesting idea from this Buddhist perspective of, of getting off the wheel of samsara. Oh, and on that note, oh yeah, yeah, Noe, please. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, therefore, if I'm good right so to speak i'm good i see the the necess i see uh i see the virtues that that i can can act, enact as as someone who's compassionate i see that i have to i can make that effort that i remove the word have to <laughs> you know good catch yeah there's <laughs> compassion there's the effort and uh, and and uh, uh, what was the third one there? The unique vow. Huh? And the, the unique vow. vow. The unique vow, but that is that is moment by moment, because reality is moment by moment. It's consistent. It never ends. It doesn't begin. It doesn't stop. Uh, uh, it is concrete. But my interaction with it is is I'm good. The meditation of nothingness. I'm not a, well, meditation of nothing. Yeah, sort of, sort of. I just wanted to thank you for that, uh, and and thank the Buddha for that writing. Yeah. Thanks, Noe. Anybody else? Questions, comments, answers, ideas. All right. Yeah, Tanya. This is from earlier when you were talking about um, the Bodhisattva. You know transferring merit, whatever merit the Bodhisattva comes up with, transferring merit to everybody else. And then that causes more merit for the Bodhisattva. It's like a Bodh it's like a merit pump, right? Because yep. then, then that just goes out and then more comes in and goes out. And it yep. just sounds like a really nice sort of per self-perpetuating and um, not only self-perpetuating, but also, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you know, making it get bigger and bigger and bigger with every round. There's a better way of saying that, but that's what I'm kind of getting at. The, the Buddhist term for it is inexhaustible. Ah. Mm. It becomes inexhaustible. It's a beautiful idea. Yeah, Tanya, thank you so much for even you mentioning that. And your analogy of the pump, I would then kind of piggyback off of your upaya and say it, the vow is like priming the pump. Mm. And I don't, I don't know if everybody knows what priming a pump is, but that idea of like a pump isn't flowing at first, but when you do the priming and you get it flowing, you can step away and the, it'll just flow by itself. It's a great, great, uh, great analogy. Yeah. But then it would be like a trickle then that goes to like a, a creek that goes to like, you know, yeah. That's the idea. That's the idea. Beautiful. All right. Uh, Michael. Yo. Um, what, so what, when is this from? When, when is the sutra from? This, this sutra is from whenever they're all from, or Mahayana, Mahayanically speaking. So, so it's like the explosion of later sutras. Yeah, I mean, for me as a historian, I'd tell you that this is probably from around two to 300 AD. Okay, yeah, just general. I'm not trying to, yep. you know. Um, and, and it's like a giant sutra that's sort of cosmology and sort of what are we up to? I mean, it just seems like it's like, maybe it's taken on too much. It's a bit, it's, it's a bit uh, ambitious here of Captain Buddha. Yes. And I, think, you know, yeah. I, I appreciate Brendan, you saying that I did want to mention that about this sutra, 
So it's why I actually have I've wanted to teach this suture for a while. So you probably know Manjushri. Manjushri is the bodhisattva of emptiness, the bodhisattva of pranya wisdom. When when you when you've got a Manjushri sutra, get ready for some of the most technical Buddhist philosophy, like really really technical. So it's very interesting that this is a Manjushri Sutra, but it's one of these wild, you know, pure land sutras in that way. And the reason why I've been wanting to, to teach this sutra is because I think that, you know, the thing that I was saying about, about the transference of merit and the way that that counteracts certain ways of thinking, it's a very subtle form of practice. And what I mean by that is it's like, it's so subtle because you're literally working with thought. You're not, not working with your, pardon me, but you're not working with your genitals and like that. It's like you're working with the most subtlest form of aspirations, the most subtlest forms. And what I've learned is how impactful these sutras can be just by contemplating what they're talking about. I mean, it's why I teach sutras in general is because I believe just thinking about these ideas is transformative. It's practice all unto itself. So, and you all ran into, you may all know too, that I also feel that sutras are very, um, so, or a sutra like this in particular, it's very magical in the sense that it, you know, I, let's see. Yeah, it's too late for all of this. I was going about to launch into a whole other thing, but I do want to mention this about this sutra. So thanks again, Brendan, for bringing me back to like the sutra as a text. So when we started reading this, I was originally reading from our good old you know, every Sunday night for years now, we've been reading from a treasury of Mahayana sutras, which is a partial translation of a collection of sutras called the Maharatnakuta collection. So this is a collection of 49 sutras. The Maharatnakuta is a collection of 49 sutras. This is the 15th sutra. The thing about it is, though, is that everybody knows that I have some big problems with this book because they, the, the editor, the translator and editor, they just randomly drop large portions of the sutra, or they will randomly drop a line, just a line, or maybe a paragraph or maybe a whole chapter, but when they do that, all they do is put three dots. Whether it's a line, a paragraph, or an entire chapter. And so if you don't know Chinese and you can't refer to the original, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know what they left out. Now, I mean, I'm very grateful to this book. Everybody knows. I mean, I really you know, celebrate this book because I read from it all the time. But that's kind of very problematic. And what I want you all to know is that I started reading this sutra, the sutra that we're reading, the Manjushri Pure Land Sutra. I started reading it from this book, but then this book stopped. And for weeks and weeks and weeks now, I've been relying on the Tibetan, uh, an English version from the Tibetan. So I just want you to know that they, they have left out the entire body of the sutra. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. But what I'm here to tell you is, is that we have finally gotten back to where the book picks up. So next week, we'll be back on having two English translations to work with, as well as my own English translation that I've been working on. And yeah, so Brendan, I know that's not a total response to your comment, but afforded me the opportunity to talk more about where this sutra is going to go in that way. Well, that's helpful. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, 
and for tonight. But yeah, that's that's a awesome. Nice. All right, everybody. That's gonna be it for me for tonight. Cool. Um. So do you um. Thank you so much. Yeah. And um, do you have, I just put in um, into the chat ways that you can keep up with what oh, MC is up to. Um, do you have any announcements you want to make, Michael? I do just one real quick, which is that I'm going to start a new class next month, July 9th. And it's an eight week course on the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, otherwise known as the Diamond Sutra. This is a sutra, very famous sutra. Uh, I actually did a, my own translation of this many, many years ago. And so I'm teaching a course using my translation. Uh, again, it's an eight week course, a line by line study of the whole diamond sutra. It's actually called the Vajra Sutra. Uh, and again, July 9th, uh, it's a Saturday morning class on Zoom, July 9th to August 27th. And you can go to lotusunderground.com and register or find out more about the class. Awesome. Totally. Thank you.